Well, many thanks to all of you that are tuning in to our uh, sheep industry convention today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the meeting so far, and there's a lot more yet to come. I, uh, from the words of Tammy Fisher, she said, I'm really excited about this virtual uh, connection. We'll be able to see every committee, and I'm sure a lot of y'all uh, uh, have, have been in a position where you'd like to have been at another committee and, and, and miss that. So that's a plus. Uh, I think everything's going quite well. It looks like it is on this end. Uh, we've got a lot of more good stuff to come, including the Rams pack tonight. Uh, five o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Uh, if you have not uh, uh, checked on that, you can um, you can do it right now uh, on Zoom. Uh, if you hadn't checked out uh, the auction items, and there's a, as I understand, uh, there's 47 of them. I'll encourage you to uh, check on that right now. You can uh, you can find a link on our uh, auction page in chat or our convention page at uh, sheepusa.org. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Angus Gidley Baird, and many thanks to RoboBank for its generous sponsorship of this year's convention. Angus is a senior analyst in Sydney, Australia, responsible for research and analysis of the local and global animal protein sectors. Angus provides regular market updates on beef, sheep meat, pork, poultry, and seafood. Angus is going to uh, provide an overview um, and an outlook on global sheep industry and the highlights and opportunities for growth on our U.S. domestic uh, sector. And like we've been doing through the day, uh, I'd like for you to submit your questions to chat. And when we get through, uh, we're going to address those with Angus. Uh, uh, we'll try and cover as many of those as, as we can. Thank you, Angus, for being with us today. Not a problem. Thank you very much. I trust you can all hear me at that end. Uh, good morning. Well, good evening. I think it is your time over there. Uh, great to be online and part of this session uh, for, for today. And thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you um, uh, to, today and, and run through a couple of other things that we're seeing in, in the, uh, well, the global uh, sheep, sheep industry and the sheep meat industry in particular. Now, just bear with me for a minute whilst I uh, try and organize my screens here and, and bring up uh, the presentation um, so we can all see this. Um, uh, sharing screen, right. Okay, I trust that you can all see that, uh, that screen at the moment. Um, unfortunately, I can't see, um, I can't see the, the, the chat room on my screen. I'm, I'm limited with the, the, the capacity I've got here, but um, hopefully I trust you can all see that. And if not, I'm so, sure someone will share that in my ear um, and let me know. Anyway, firstly, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I, I trust that the convention is going well. Uh, it's a shame I couldn't be there in person. I have had the good fortune of being uh, or, or traveling to the US a couple of years ago and seeing a couple of, uh, of your sheep operations over there, sheep meat operations, which were very impressive. Um, granted, somewhat different to some of the things that we see here, uh, but still uh, very impressive. And, and I find it fascinating what you guys are doing over there in the US industry uh, for a number of reasons, not just because um, it's a big market for an Australian uh, supplier of sheep meat, uh, but also because of, you know, how, how you're running production systems over there. Um, we're starting to see some development of feedlot style systems over here for, for lambs. Um, but also, you know, the, some of the challenges that you're facing and opportunities that you're facing. I think we share a lot of those as well. So, um, hopefully sometime in the future, I might be able to get over there uh, myself and, and catch up with a number of you. Um, but otherwise, a quick shout out to all those guys that might be listening in uh, that I've caught up with or spoken to over the last couple of years. Um, I do find myself as one of the few, uh, few people within Rabobank that know a lot about the sheep industry, um, in particular uh, fat lambs, but also uh, I also cover wool. So 
Uh, most of this presentation will actually be focused on the sheep meat side of things, but as I mentioned, I do cover wool and happy to take any questions on that if people have them. I thought I'd start with a nice, nice picture here. I don't know how much uh, sheep dogs play a part in, in the American sheep system, uh, but they're very important for Australian sheep producers over here. Uh, a couple of dogs is, a, is an invaluable tool for, for managing sheep operations here. And, and I just noticed in the last couple of days or the last week, actually, we've had some sheep dog sales here and, and some of these good dogs uh, are fetching up in the order of about 20,000 Australian dollars. So the price of a, uh, a small car, really, uh, which gives you an idea of the value of, of what they, the role they play in, in the operations. A quick little bit about me and about Rabo for those people that don't uh, or aren't aware of what we uh, in, in Rabo do. So Rabo is, is a uh, solely uh, food and agri dedicated bank around the world, apart from uh, the homeland being uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, other than that, everywhere else in the world, it is solely focused on food and agri. And as a result, uh, we feel it's important to know what's going on in those markets and as such have created a dedicated team of analysts of which I am one. Um, uh, but I've got colleagues around the world uh, in, in a whole range of different sectors from dairy and grains and oil seeds and sugar and farm inputs and supply chains. Um, I'm part of the animal proteins team, uh, which basically covers all the meats. Uh, and, and obviously uh, have colleagues around the world. Uh, you may have met in the US, Christine McCracken, who looks after our pork and poultry. Also, Don Close, who uh, looks after our beef over there. But um, here, granted that there aren't many major producing areas of the world, uh, it, it effectively comes to me uh, for the sheep meat market commentary and uh, a colleague in New Zealand, uh, who, who has just actually unfortunately moved into a new position as of last month. So I am the sole sheep person at the moment within Rabobank. So where to start? Well, I thought we'd start at the very beginning and look at the, the big players in global sheep meat. Uh, uh, and a question uh, to those in the audience to test your brain. Um, it's a bit of a giveaway with the map, but who is the biggest sheep meat producer in the world? Um, often it's something that you don't necessarily think about, but just given the size of the country and the number of people in that population, uh, it's not hard to understand why China is the biggest sheep meat producer in the world. With an estimated flock, I think of about 300 million, um, they produce almost 5 million tonnes of sheep meat, uh, a year and sheep meat when we talk sheep meat in a global context a lot of the global figures are actually including goat as well uh, and for a lot of those that might be listening on the line at the moment who are in sort of prime quality lamb production um, sheep meat also includes mutton as well so you can see on that map there uh, quite a strong dominance of the Asian sort of North American countries. Uh, Europe, obviously a, a long time sheep meat producer and, and the EU 28 is the second largest um, area producing sheep meat. It, it produces just under a million tons. Uh, and then we've got India and Australia and Sudan uh, in, in Africa, rounding out the top sort of five sheep meat producers in the world. Not surprisingly, those producers are also some of the largest consumers and, and it is um, a, uh, a point with the sheep meat industry that it isn't a highly traded commodity not like what we see with uh, pork poultry and, and beef where there is large there are large trade volumes a lot of the sheep meat production is actually consumed domestically within the, the country that it is produced so um, again we see you know the largest consumers uh, being China Europe um, India is a very large consumer consumers in Nigeria as well. So they're the largest consumers. What's been happening over time? Well, I've pulled a graph here. This is from an, an agri benchmark study that actually looks at a series of uh, operations globally and uh, compares their operating costs. And I've got a, a slide later in the presentation um, where I look at some of the costs of production. But here they've just pulled the change in production um, in, a, in a number of 
of selected countries. So going by a decade, um, I can read my own graph here. Uh, on the left-hand side, the red lines are basically the, the mid-60s to the mid-70s. Um, and then as you work across those columns there, you go through each decade so that the green bar represents the, uh, the change, the production change from the mid noughties, I suppose you call them, 2008 through to 2017. Uh, um, as you can see there, are a lot of major producing countries have experienced positive growth. Um, China being the standout on the left-hand side, some very strong growth back through the, uh, the late 80s and into the 90s as well. Um, since then, that growth has started to dissipate a little bit, um, and it's now back around the 2% the mark. Um, we also see some strong growth in places like Algeria, um, South Africa had a spurt there, Syria. So around that Middle East, North African area, um, growth in production as well. But as I noted before, a lot of those countries are actually um, uh, produce as much as they consume and they don't actually import much, nor do they actually export a lot. Australia and New Zealand, who are probably, the, well, they are the largest exporters in the world, you can see there have uh, actually sort of a lot slower growth rates, interestingly, uh, over the last sort of three to four decades. Um, generally less than 2% growth, and we've actually seen New Zealand decline in the last couple of years, uh, a, a big drop um, up to 2017. And I understand the, the forecast by the New Zealand industry at the moment is that they're expecting another 6% drop in production for the 2020-21 season. So um, a lot of factors going on in New Zealand, including competition from the dairy industry for available land. Uh, we've got some environmental regulations that are coming into play now that are limiting the ability for producers to expand operations or increase intensity of operations um, because of um, environmental restrictions. We're also going to start seeing changes in land use uh, driven by some of those environmental restrictions as well that might see uh, some of that grazing land that was used for sheep production being planted down to, uh, to tree plantations, etc. So um, we're not expecting a large growth or actually we're expecting a, a in New Zealand production uh, in, in the coming years. This is a, a graph showing the global sheep meat consumption. Um, and I've taken it from the OECD FAO, but it does reflect where we think global markets are going to go at the moment. And it's encouraging to see as a sheep meat producer um, that they're expecting that global consumption of sheep meat to continue ticking up. Uh, you can see there for the last 20 odd years, it's been a fairly increasing consumption and just expecting that trend to continue. Um, it's an interesting thing and we'll get into it in a minute in terms of the, uh, the, the markets that we're looking at. But a lot of those markets, as I've noted before, really sheep meat production is, is about subsistence um, and, and providing a protein source for those markets. It's not seen as a huge global trade um, product uh, like some of the other proteins. So really that that expected continued growth in consumption, I think is pretty fair. Noted that, uh, that China is driving most of that growth. Um, and in 2018, we saw the imports were contributing to about 6% of consumption, sheep meat consumption in China. Um, we expect those imports to continue to play a larger role into the future. Um, there have been some programs in China that are encouraging domestic sheep meat production, um, but not as much focus placed on those as there are are on say, pork production or poultry production over there. So um, we have heard, and I am aware of some New Zealand uh, operators, for example, uh, um, working with Chinese operators to, to help improve productivity over there, increasing and improving their genetics. Um, that was a couple of years ago. That will start to flow through. We'll start to see some increase in production. But generally, the growth in China, I think, uh, in, from a consumption point of view, is going to exceed that growth in supply. So continue to need imports into the future. But where are the real trade opportunities? Because I've noted before that a lot of those producing countries are also consuming countries and they net out to be uh, relatively neutral. Um, and I think it's important to note here that we're effectively looking at almost two separate markets. Um, Left-hand side, we've got the, the prime lamb market and, and probably being directed to more of a premium 
restaurant style, higher quality, higher income bracket um, type consumer. On the right hand side, you've got your more sort of mainstream um, conventional mutton supply, sheep meat supply, goat would fall into that in terms of the, the global numbers as well. Um, and basically, we've got these, these two markets that are operating in parallel. Now, it's a great thing as a sheep meat producer, you've got an opportunity to sell your higher valued lambs uh, into those high premium markets. And then at the same time, um, sell the, the lower price mutton into, into markets where it's probably more of a staple. So it works well from an Australian point of view. Um, I must admit, we, we, are, we are benefiting from the growth in lamb consumption in, in America. And we're seeing a lot of our sort of our prime cuts, our loin cuts, our leg cuts um, going to the US, whereas a lot more of our four quarter cuts from lambs, but also our mutton going to places like the Middle East to China um, that are just taking it as a, a lower price point protein. Um, but I did an interesting in, uh, analysis just looking at some of those key producing and, and exporting uh, regions. And, and basically out of those sort of the top sort of 10 countries from a production and consumption point of view, if you start to map it by the supply deficit, which is on the x-axis across the bottom there. So you can see Australia way over in the left, that gold, that yellow circle, um, basically showing we're a, a large net exporter. On the right hand side, you've got places like China in red uh, and also uh, Saudi Arabia in green, which are large importers. Um, then on the y-axis, I've got, I, I mapped the, um, the national income per capita. This is in US dollars. So as we go higher up that scale there, uh, it's, it's a more wealthy consumer purchasing that product. So you, you can see US, the little blue dot right at the top there, um, in that highest gross national income, whereas a lot of those sort of Northern African, um, uh, Sub-Saharan, Middle Eastern countries are right down near the, the lower end of that gross national income. So to me, um, the interesting thing is, well, where do you try and target your product and what markets are we looking at? And, and I think um, for me, we're, we're probably looking at this segment up here. Um, noting that the, the size of the bubble here is actually reflecting the per capita consumption. Um, so we've got reasonable per capita consumption here. Um, we're looking at, uh, uh, if I can find that there, Sudan, which is the green one here. It's got the highest at about 11 kilograms per person. Sorry, I'm, I'm speaking kilograms in Australian language. Um, about 11 kilograms per person per year. And then we drop down to the US, we actually under a one kilo per person per year. But I think this is the sort of area in terms of growth opportunities where we can actually focus. Now, noting, of course, the light blue is Europe. It's a very well-developed market and probably not going to see a lot of growth. In fact, we pro possibly might see some contraction in consumption over there. Uh, we're also going to see some sort of consolidation in their sheep meat industry, I would expect as well. Um, so we might see that sort of be relatively stable. But I think, you know, places like the Middle East and Asia, um, in this sort of bracket here where we're expecting incomes to be increasing, um, we've got a reasonably high level of awareness and comfort with lamb already given their, their size of their uh, per capita consumption. And they've also got a very big supply deficit. So they're needing those imports. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the growth opportunities will come in terms of sheep meat. Sheep meat is holding its own though in that global um, market. And um, we've got to remember that it is a less familiar protein for a lot of people across the, across the world. Um, and uh, a lot of it is, is probably consumed outside of the home. Um, so what we're finding is that, um, for example, in places like China, 65% of it is consumed outside of the home. Um, so selling it through retail channels becomes more difficult, but I've thrown these two up here just as an explanation. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got the Chinese retail meat prices, and you can see there that yeah, beef prices and sheep meat prices track very similar, um, and, and they've been at the higher end of that protein scale for a while. So um, it is considered a more premium product than, than the pork and poultry, um, and it is holding its own 
particular in that market. On the right-hand side here, that's a picture of a, um, a retail shelf in Japan. I was lucky enough to go over there a couple of years ago and happened to be walking through one of the stores and I found New Zealand Lamb. It's, uh, it's a company from New Zealand. Uh, if you can read the label there, it might be familiar to you. Um, and it was selling at that time, it was 458 yen per 100 grams. Uh, they price everything per 100 grams over in Japan, which I calculate to be about five or 70 per 100 grams in Australia, which is $57 a kilo. Uh, my calculations based on current exchange rates means that that's about 19 US dollars a pound uh, at the moment. Now, that was three or four years ago. I expect that that's probably gone up. Um, a little bit since then, but that's that's probably similar to where we'd be expecting to pay for uh, for lamb in the, in the Australian retail shelves at the moment. Um, and it sits with with the US prices, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's about what we see for for Australia at the moment. Um, obviously, the the two different markets that we've got and balancing the the lower cuts, the lower price cuts, lower value cuts of mutton and also lamb. Uh, and those more premium cuts uh, into probably restaurant trade is, is a challenge. And, and I highlight that at the end uh, as a couple of things that are, that are worth watching. So global uh, sheet meat exports are expected to increase this, uh, to meet this growing consumption. Um, and while sheet meat is still a small commodity on global trade markets, of the approximate sort of 19 million tonnes of meat that are traded, that's beef, pork, poultry and sheep meat, um, sheep meat makes up only about 5.7% um, compared to the large players of beef, pork and poultry, which are all up around 30% of that market. So it is a very small part of the, the global animal protein trade. Um, and I think that's one of the opportunities for the market is that you're not going to be swamped by a large player in that market um, or large volumes moving around. Um, with the, the, the continued supply deficit that we see in the, uh, the Asian markets, we think that we're going to see continued growth into those markets over the next five years, albeit with some of the political sensitivities around trade at the moment um, and, and um, tensions with China, but still the, the growing population, the increasing wealth in that market, the, the increased customization to, um, to, to red meat in particular, um, is going to see the, the volume of product, uh, imported product into that market continue to grow. Um, and, and I think China is a unique market in the sense that you've got a lot of northern China that's actually already quite heavily exposed to sheep meat. Um, it's then about educating that consumer as to the value of that product. Um, and it's not just simply a, uh, a hot pot product uh, used in a soup or a stew, um, but it can actually be a premium meat cut. Uh, that can be turned into uh, to, to, to more restaurant try style, style uh, consumption. Australia represents, and you can see here the light blue, about 40% of that global export market. And together with New Zealand, I think we make up just about 70%. As I noted before, New Zealand production is expected to decline over the next couple of years as Australia is expected to increase. And that's probably my segue into uh, effectively part two, uh, where I'm going to talk a little bit about the Australian industry. Um, but I'm happy to pause there if there are any questions at the moment um, and, uh, and take any of those questions on sort of the global market and the outlook to date. Angus, we haven't, we don't have any formulated right now, so just go forward. All right, no problem. Sounds good. I'll keep on going then. So, jumping into my backyard, being the uh, the Australian sheep meat industry, and I thought I'd throw a couple of photos up here. These are taken from um, a number of our uh, Australian rural managers uh, across the board. Um, the Australian sheep industry is spread for the generally around the southern parts of the country and more inclined to be more coastal. Um, there's not a lot growing in the middle of central Australia, unfortunately, um, but a, a lot of sort of rangeland, sort of coastal fringes, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, into, into Western Australia. Uh, we currently have about 63 million sheep and um, that number has been declining. I'll show you a graph in a minute. Um, we're about 40 million breeding years 
Merinos. Merino is the predominant breed that we have in Australia. About 75% of these breeding ewes are Merinos. And of that, 73% um, of those will be used for purebred Merino lamb production. So wool still plays a very big factor in the Australian sheep, meat, sheep complex, um, very heavily dominated by that Merino breed. Um, we, we are starting to see some producers in, in Merino operations now looking at that lamb market as a, uh, a, as a very good alternative market for them. Um, and as a result, um, starting to adapt and, and develop breeding strategies to increase either uh, uh, improve lambing rates or increase weight gain uh, in that market. Our lamb marking rates are about 92% for merinos and about 110% for non-merinos. Uh, a couple of other pictures that I've got up here. That's, uh, that one there's in, in central New South Wales in Dubbo, or the first one was in Victoria, the, the second one's in Dubbo, uh, central New South Wales. That picture's in Western Australia where it's a lot more arid, um, a lot more focused on wool production over there. And they send a lot of live, live sheep over to the Middle East uh, as a trade source. Um, these pictures here, this is a Merino stud in Southern New South Wales. And I've got the screenshot there of a, um, a computer reader that they're doing its HUD um, and they're measuring a whole lot of traits within those um, within their merino flock and selecting their their rams and ewes accordingly um, to, to develop some particular traits that they're chasing um, but I just threw that up there I, I don't expect anyone to be able to read it but there's a whole lot of data along the bottom of that screen there uh, on all the different traits from um, you know staple length um, micron diameter um, uh, um, uh, yield, cut per fleece, um, lambing rates, um, weight gain on lambs, etc. So quite a technical operation in terms of measuring all those traits and then selecting accordingly for them. Um, and the final one I've got up here is a picture of a, uh, a, a bunch of feeders. Um, as I mentioned before, feedlotting is starting to become a little bit more popular in Australia. Uh, admittedly, it, it has to date really been about trying to smooth out our seasons. So um, you know, we've got very dry seasons, very wet seasons, and balancing your, your flock number uh, through those seasons is quite a challenge. So what we're starting to see now is um, feeding operations are being brought in to try and smooth that supply. So not necessarily a, uh, a standalone operation to, to take um, uh, feeder weight lambs and put them through in, in a feedlot and then, and then sell them out, but more a case of, um, existing sheep meat operators that are sectioning off a particular pen on their property, adding a feeder, throwing a feeder into it, using a bit of grain and able to either finish lambs or supplement sheep and lambs due, during dry seasons. So we're starting to see a little bit more of that going on. Uh, it's becoming a little bit more popular um, and, and I think we'll start to see a little bit more of it. But I'm intrigued looking at the US industry um, and the dominance or the, the prevalent of feedlotting over there and understanding how that works and how it might fit into the Australian system as we start to see more of these take off. Um, they're becoming more popular, but there are a lot of challenges as well uh, for a traditionally grazing system that, that simply put uh, sheep and lambs onto paddocks of oats uh, to finish them to now trying to balance the cost of feed and the feed conversion ratios that they're getting out of that feed um, at the same time managing the obviously the cost of the lamb and the, uh, the final price of the finished lamb as well. The last 24 months in Australia has been one of poetry, land of drought and flooding rains. Um, we went through 2019 as probably one of the driest years on record here. And as a result, that's had a, a, a lasting legacy on us, all of Australian livestock uh, and, and in particular sheep as well. Sheep flock has been affected heavily as a result of that bushfires in at the beginning of 2020 just for good measure COVID came along and went um, and then at the beginning of 2000 and uh, well first half of 2020 basically we started to see much improved rainfall um, and as a result the grass returned and uh, you know livestock prices jumped through the roof because everyone wanted to buy sheep and uh, and, and try and restock those properties after they destocked them heavily as a result of those, that drought. And we 
you can see the slaughter numbers on the left hand side there i've got the the lamb slaughter number you can see the 10-year range in in blue then 2019 we basically started to bump along the bottom of that that uh, range for, uh, for for land slaughter in 2020. For the first well, first couple of months, it was okay, but then we particularly suffered through May through to July with very low numbers of slaughter numbers um, as a result of probably that that U cull that occurred through the, in 2019, and just the, the the lambing rates would have been down, um, the conception rates would have been down, and as a result, much more much fewer lambs came through in that mid part of 2020. We've started to see that pick up again at the end of last year and we're back around close to normal now at the moment and we're expecting that to increase. Um, the sheep slaughter is a, a, a much more, or is, is much more highly exposed to uh, the, the climate. And as a result, 2020, uh, we saw very low sheep numbers, sheep slaughter numbers. That's purely a result of the improved season. So everyone would have culled sheep through 2019 when it was very dry. Um, 2020, a much improved season. So it meant that people were holding on to sheep and not actually sending them to slaughter anymore. So we saw the lowest sheep slaughter number for 2020 that we've seen in, in about 40, well, over 45 years, according to my records. So, uh, people really holding on to what sheep they've got left. Um, and that's going to mean that over the next couple of years, we're going to start to see that lamb volume pick up as we move through the system. So um, last year, lamb slaughter was about 15 million, which is about 9% down on the previous uh, previous five years and, and probably one of our lowest for 15 years. Um, just a quick note on COVID there. We didn't really have much impact on uh, as a result of any plant disruptions with COVID. Um, yes, we had a number of plants that were actually closed for short periods of time when they had outbreaks or COVID cases. Um, a couple of, uh, well, at one stage in Victoria, we had three plants, three of our largest plants shut. Um, but because we had such low volumes of lambs and sheep in the system, um, they were able to spread those amongst the existing or the, 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 the plants that remained open. Uh, and we didn't see much disruption or much uh, shock to the market as a result of plant closures from, from COVID-19. So, um, we were fortunate in that sense. Um, if it had have been, if COVID had have struck us in 2019 when we were trying to push large volumes of sheep and lamb through the system, it probably would have been a very different story. But we were very fortunate last year um, in terms of the timing in that we had very low numbers going through the system. So when our plants were closed as a result of COVID, it didn't create the same sort of waves that we've seen in other areas. As a result of this, we expect land production in 2020 to drop by about um, 3%, uh, down to about 487,000 tonnes. This is one of the lowest levels we've seen in the last 10 years. But based on the fact that we've had an improved season through 2020, um, and this will continue into 2021, as I'm speaking to you at the moment, it's raining here in Sydney, um, and it's continued to be wet through summer so we're expecting good pasture growth uh, for a lot of our sheep producing areas and 2021 is expected to see a, re a recovery in land production lifting to about 528,000 tonnes. Um, we um, uh, this this is going to continue over the next couple of years as that flock continues to, to, to rebuild as well. Um, and as a result of that increased production we will probably a 4% increase in, um, in, in exports and an 8% increase in uh, mutton exports as well. So unfortunately for, for you guys in the US, it probably means that you're going to start to see more Australian lamb come back on the shelves um, over the next couple of years as our production starts to, to increase. Um, uh, but also we'll be looking for, for other markets and we've really got to try and rediscover our Middle Eastern markets. We've seen those volumes drop off um, so China and working through the situation there given the disruption with African swine fever. All this caused some major changes in, in our pricing, um, our Australian lamb prices. You've got here the 10 year range or five, five year range, I apologize, uh, for lamb prices and what we call the Eastern market, oh, sorry, the Eastern States trade lamb indicator, which is basically a lamb that we sell. It's about 23 kilos um, as a trade lamb. 
only two, three kilos. I can't work that out off the top of my head. Sorry to convert that to pounds at the moment as a carcass weight. Um, and this is the, uh, the standard index pricing index we look at through the year. So that's the five year range. Last year, we saw it at the very high end of that, the top end of we're setting new records all year uh, in terms of record prices for, for lamb. And then into, sorry, that was 2019. Into 2020, those record prices continued. If you remember a couple of slides back, I showed that really severe reduction in lamb supply through probably quarter two of 2020. And you can see the result there, lamb prices stayed very high um, through the first half of 2020 before dropping back down. We started to see the supply come back online. Um, now we've, we've actually seen the, the prices come back up again as supply has sort of uh, eased off a little bit. Um, but interestingly, we continue to see some strong demand in markets, but we've also got continuing low numbers here. So that's helping lamps lamp prices um in australia i've converted this to a us cents uh per pound uh for you guys just to, to to give you an idea so the corresponding 2019 is in a dotted line and uh 2020 is in a in the blue dotted line there to give you an idea so uh by my calculations at the moment we're we're operating at about 250 uh us cents per pound for trade lamps in australia at the moment I expect those prices are going to come down next year. We're not going to see the same peaks that we had uh, through this year as, as our supply continues to rebuild. Um, it'll be a much more conservative year through 2020, 21, I think. But given um, we still have limited supplies, um, we, we're going to see um, uh, those prices still remain relatively high. Um, a quick one on cost of here um, because I know that was a question and I know in terms of a sh an, an American sheep producer and, and an Australian one trying to get a gauge on what the costs are uh, over here compared to what you're faced with in the US uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to know uh, to, to sort of completely identify it here in Australia as I mentioned a lot of our sheep producers are, are very heavily focused on wool production as well um, a lot of our sheep producers sheep meat producers are also in mixed farming operations so they'll run cattle and sheep um, they'll run they'll have a cropping operation and sheep so separating out the costs of those operations and apportioning them to the individual enterprise is a little bit more difficult this is something i've pulled from agri benchmark and if you wanted to feel free to google agri benchmark um, there's some reports on the websites they compare some sentinel sort of uh, properties around the world in different parts europe um, australia some of the um, uh, i think some of the South American country there as well and get an idea of the cost of production. Um, uh, they, they estimate here the cash costs are sort of in the order of about um, $1.50 or $1 or dollar to $2 uh, per kilogram of live weight produced. Um, uh, and I did have that calculated. I think that works out to be about 68 US cents uh, per pound um, of live weight produced. And that... That is to um, another um, benchmarking um, program that we've got in Australia that's run by our government organisation here that also estimate our total cash costs uh, are in that sort of $2, um, $2 to $2.50 um, Australian dollars um, per kilogram of live weight produced, which is, is a similar, similar number. So working around about, uh, according to my calculations, about that 68 um, 68 cents uh, US per pound of live weight produced as cash costs um, to give you an idea of the, the cost of production there. So um, doing quite well given the, the returns that re they're receiving for, for lambs at the moment. So um, the strength of the Australian lamb industry is going to be continued to be fueled by our, our export growth. Our domestic consumption of lamb in Australia is actually slowly declining. It's something that we've got to try and do. And if anyone wants a Funny laugh. Feel free to Google MLA Australia Lamb Ad. Um, they put out a lamb ad every day, every year at, at this time of year. Um, there's usually a bit of Australian satire in there to try and promote lamb consumption um, in Australia. Um, it's a good laugh. Um, but generally, our domestic consumption is declining and we're seeing growth in export markets. Um, we saw in export volumes increase 13% in the last five years, 70% in the last 10 years. The strongest growth has been in China. Um, 
with 100% in the last five years. And also the US has been a very good market for us. Um, we've actually seen the Middle East contract, um, which is concerning. Um, some of the removal of the government support in the, US, in, in the Middle East for um, lamb imports has, has seen those imports decline. I've just got uh, a couple more slides here. This is the Australian per unit export returns to give you an idea of where we're sending lamb and the prices we receive. Now, this is not a per cut. Um, the only prices per cut that I actually get are US import prices of Australian lamb, and you guys know those probably better than I do. Um, but this is a per unit um, export return. So total volume uh, so total value of, of exports divided by total volume to give you a um, per unit export. And I've put it there in US cents per pound to, to give you an idea of the different markets and what they're paying. So generally, um, you've got US are a very positive market for us. But again, that's influenced by the type of cuts that we're sending there. As I said, a lot more of the loins and legs go into the US um, compared to the Middle East and, um, and China that take a lot more of our four quarter cuts and therefore a lower price point anyway. Uh, but generally, um, you know, you see some very similar price movements in those markets, largely affected by the global supply and demand situation. I just had two slides that I wanted to throw up and conscious of the time. Um, one was the, the key challenges, I think, for the, the, the Australian and global sheet meat industry. And the second one is the opportunities I see um, for, for the sheet meat industry. I think there are three, to me, uh, you know, from a challenge point of view, if you put all the, the um, uh, geopolitical situations aside, um, some of the health and animal welfare, oh, sorry, health um, and human that really um, are very, very difficult to predict. Um, these are some of the three key challenges, I think, for the, uh, for the lamb industry as, as we sit at the moment. Um, I did not include in there, but I should have included in there um, animal welfare and also should have included in there sustainability or environmental issues, um, both of which are, I, I think are, are becoming a lot more front of mind for consumers and they're starting to look for that, but they're, they're seeking out and, 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 uh, and choosing to buy. But I think a challenge for, for um, the sheet meat industry is, is converting new customers and educating them on how to cook and eat. Um, you guys would know it just as well as I would, but the US is a, a key, key example of, of how older generations had an exposure to sheep meat and it was mutton. Now converting that newer generation over to, to lamb um, and understanding how to cook it, how to prepare it um, and how to eat it as a more premium product rather than sort of a, a, a staple. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges and it's totally within the control of the industry to manage that. Um, the other one is managing the supply and demand, uh, noting that we've got two separate markets, effectively a, a, a high price premium market and then a, a low price sort of commodity market. And it's just balancing those two to make sure that we don't see it overpriced. I know from an Australian perspective here, you can ask any Australian consumer if they've eaten lamb lately. And one of the reasons they probably cite for not doing it is because the price has just continued to go up. So we used to be very big consumers of it. We are less so now, and a lot of that is starting to do with price. And we're just seeing the price of, of lamb increase uh, to the point where people are starting to, to stop buying it. So it, we've got to manage that supply demand. The other thing I think we've got to manage is the quality of production. And this is an interesting conversation that I've had with the equipment producers. Um, I note that your lambs are much bigger than our lambs. And we are actually even bigger than the New Zealand ones. Um, and it's just trying to understand what the type of product is that that consumer wants and producing it to match it. We've got a few programs that are going underway here in Australia looking at eating quality standards and also our pricing systems. We don't have as a developed pricing system like you do where you're paid on, uh, I think, on, on weight and also yield um, and also quality. Um, in Australia, we're basically paid on weight. Um, which means that, you know, the bigger the animal you produce, um, the more you're going to be paid. But unfortunately, that means that that, that lamb leg is no longer two kilos or that, that loin chop is too big for the plate. Um, we've got to be careful how we actually encourage the production of the things that the consumer wants to, to, to consume. And lastly, in terms of the opportunities, I think sheep meat is probably one of the industries 
markets that have got a huge amount of opportunity, but it's in the context that it's a relatively niche um, um, industry. It's a re reasonably small scale opera, um, market with with a few, very few large scale producers. And I say that in the context because I'm completely aware that, you know, from a US sheep producer's point of view, you see Australia as, as the massive supplier in the market, uh, import, uh, exporting into, into that US market. Um, and I, I, I recognize that completely. But I say this in a context of, of, say, looking at beef or poultry or pork, for example, where you have. You know, from a beef point of view, you've got, you know, North America, Australia, New Zealand, South America, all the South American countries as major exporters and producers. Pork, you've got Canada, North America, Brazil, China, Europe as major exporters. Um, from a sheep meat point of view, there are a lot fewer exporters in the market and, and, and smaller markets as well, which I just think means that we're not going to see huge volatility and variation as one mark one producer gets access and one loses access so i think it's a little bit more balanced um and i think it's a little bit more manageable um for those in the industry um you guys basically probably know let's watch australia and see what australia does we sit here and watch new zealand to see what new zealand's doing we watch china to see what china's doing from a buying point of view it's a lot it's a lot cleaner and simpler i think is a good opportunity for the market to to, to foster some of that growth Obviously, consumption growth in Asia um, is, is key to, to driving a lot of that um, new import demand, and I think that's favourable. Again, it's not, it's not a, um, an amazing growth scale that we might have seen, for example, with, with beef. Um, it's a more conservative growth scale, and I think that's probably in our favour in the sense that it allows supply to keep up with that, and we're not going to see huge variations of, of you know, uh, undersupply, which inflates prices and suddenly you see huge growths in production, which then oversupplies the market and, and the market has to reduce prices as a result. I think it's going to be a lot more controlled. So I think that's a great opportunity. And I think also sheep meat's got a lot of um, opportunities around the, the exposure that it currently has. Um, you look at places like the Middle East, the Indias, the Asias of the world, the big population centers with growth in income. Um, I think that's a, a positive. Um, it's not really constrained by, by religious beliefs like pork or beef are. Um, and in some cultures, like a lot of those Middle Eastern cultures, um, it's actually seen as a favoured meat. So I think it's about developing those markets, how you can develop them, how you can bring those consumers along. Um, and I think that's favourable for the industry to, um, to, to continue to grow in this sort of more measured manner. So I think there are a lot of positive things for the, uh, for the global industry. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll end on that, that note and happy to take any questions. popped up uh first of all how do you see brexit impacting the sheep uh, meat market in the uk yeah it's uh brexit's an interesting one um uh, well at the moment as of first of january they've effectively split the um the uk and european components of that overall uh europe component europe um tariff rate quota uh, what I understand is that places like Australia and New Zealand are all undergoing uh, trade negotiations at the moment and hopefully in the next couple of months we might see some further clarification around what those tariff rate quotas are. Um, I, I sit here as an Australian um, and look across the ditch at our New Zealand uh, counterparts and see that they've got a, a 220,000 tonne quota access into Europe. Um, I think we've got an 18,000 tonne quota access into Europe. So we're, we're hamstrung at the moment by that quota. And I think um, any trade negotiations that, that allow us to, to have increased access will be, will be beneficial. It's a valuable market um, from a pricing point, not so much from a volume point for us. It's quite a small market, only making up sort of, I think it's about 3% of our total exports at the moment, but um, it's a highly valuable market and hopefully those trade negotiations um, will, will yield greater access into that market. Thank you for that. Next, it appears the Australian sheep industry is entering a flock rebuilding phase, as you alluded to. How will that impact exports to the US and other global trade partners? 
Yeah, well, it, it, it will. Um, as I said, we're expecting uh, production to increase in this year, 2021, and the subsequent years, uh, 22, 23, as that flock rebuilds. Um, as I noted, our domestic consumption here is pretty stagnant. We're not seeing that increase much at all. Um, and the higher prices that we've got at the moment are, are not going to actually support our domestic consumption increasing uh, too much. So a lot of it is going to come down to export. Uh, I'm looking at the moment where we sit, we've seen Bahrain, for example, remove some of their government support. So that's probably going to impact Bahrain's import, imports. We've seen um, other countries um, in, in the Middle East remove some of their government support. So that's going to influ influence the, the Middle Eastern imports. Um, China, I expect... Um, we'll probably, we say, temper some of their imports as a result of their recovery recovery in the pork flock, pork herd over there, uh, following African swine fever. It's it's getting close to being back on uh, on par with what it was before, although we don't expect it to, to completely recover to levels prior to 2019, but it is recovering. And as a result, we, we feel that, you know, we're just going to see some of the, the heat taken out of the market. But... Um, from a from a sheep meat point of view and a, 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 a lamb point of view, we still feel China's demand will be strong, um, probably just not with the same sort of intensity that we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months. So that'll continue to be a favourable market for us. And, and, on, and honestly, we, we see the US as a very good market um, for Australia at the moment. It's, um, you know, everything that's that, that we see coming out of the US in terms of prices and what's going on over there is favourable. Obviously, if you can recover from COVID and, uh, and, and food service sales and restaurant sales start to pick up again, that will, will only add to, to fuel that demand. So um, I would say over the next 12 months, yeah, Australia's sheep meat exports will increase um, and probably we'll, we'll see the, the Chinese and, and US markets as key destinations for that. Here's another one that's kind of similar. How much influence does the strong American dollar and the exchange rate have on the desire to get Australian lamb into the U.S. versus other import uh, countries? Yeah, uh, very, very much so. Um, I, I think probably the uh, the ch well, I call it a challenge the the issue is that it's effectively, as a US importer, you're either looking at Australia or New Zealand and generally our exchange rates run fairly close together. So um, it, I, I don't know if it necessarily has a, as big an impact on their ability to choose, but it probably does have an impact on the cost of that product. So um, obviously we've, we've seen the Australian dollar um, it would drop drop dramatically at the beginning of the year, which was great for us, um, and and probably supported the fact that we had very high land prices here, and you didn't necessarily see that transpire into high import prices. Um, but subsequently, through the second half of last year, we started to see the Australian dollar lift, and we our in house view is that we expect the Australian dollar to lift again through the course of this year, um, which is going to mean that those Australian um, uh, imports into the US are going to become more expensive unless we actually drop our, our, our price of lambs here and the cost of lambs comes down to, to, to compensate for it. But um, the dollar does play a, um, a, a big factor in our competitive in the market, competitiveness in the market, and also, uh, you know, a factor against the other proteins in that market too. We've got to bear in mind. Good. Here's another one. I would like your thoughts concerning the future of the wool market. Super fine, medium, carpet types. Will AU producers move more towards lamb production and effects on various wool microns produced away from uh, super fine production? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And this is, this is a challenge that we have every year when we try and come up with our forecast is to try and figure out that that interplay between uh, all those sheep producers out there that are running a, a merino flock and how much how many of those use that they're actually using a terminal sire over and going to produce first cross lambs or how many are, are actually using a, a merino sire over and going into the, the, the wool production um, 
I think from an Australian point of view, if you look at our sheep flock and our um, lamb production or sheep meat production and our wool production over the last couple of years, well, not last couple of years, over the last, say, 10 or 15 years, we've started to plateau out. So we had a, a sheep flock that was up around 170 million head uh, in the late 80s, I think it was, and now it's down at 68 million, I think was the number I just quoted. Um, so we've seen a massive reduction in, in the sheep flock, um, but we've actually seen an increase in our lamb production over that period of time. So a lot of that sheep flock has been the, the weathers that have moved out of wool or those that have moved out of wool have sold off weathers. And we've now got a, effectively a, a sheep breeding flock um, that is being utilized for both wool and for, for meat production. So I think we're starting to reach a bit of a stability in our, um, in our, our wool sheep meat mix. And I mentioned when I showed some of those photos is that we're actually seeing a lot of the Merino guys continue to focus on wool, but also seeing what they can do to try and increase their, their meat yield uh, from their lambs and give them the access to both markets. Um, and when we talk sort of our, our microns here, um, I think the average microns uh, about 20 or 21. Um, so it's it's those people in that space that are the utilizing both strong wool prices. Well, they suffered quite a bit last year, so that's probably going to be not such a great thing for going forward. But we're starting to see them lift again, um, and and those strong land prices and and trying to tap into the best of both worlds. Uh, we've got those at the very the super fine end of the the spectrum, the the 16, 17, 18 micron space that are still going to be very focused on wool. And you'd think that that would be their primary objective. We're still seeing very strong prices and good prices for those super fine microns. Um, whereas the the broader wools up, you know, above 23 and beyond, um, pretty much a lamb producing operation, um, and and that's that's going to be their focus. So I actually think we're probably we're probably reaching a bit of a balance at the moment. We're not necessarily going to see a lot more movement out of wool into land, but it's more about those operations that are working both systems to get the best of both worlds. Okay, Angus, this, this is a good one, and this will be the last one that we have time for. How much do you think the fake meats will impact the meat markets? Uh, <laughs> the fake meat, yeah, that's it. It's always a good question because I think it's, it's important that we continue to ask the question. Um, and I say that, um, before answering it, I, I, I say uh, that um, it's important to keep asking that question because to me, there are reasons why consumers and why businesses and industry are moving into this space. Um, and I think as a, as a conventional meat industry, we've got to look at what those reasons are and there are still opportunities for the conventional meat industry to address some of those things. So it might be, it might be around environmental credentials. It might be around health credentials. It might be around, um, you know, animal welfare credentials. Um, all those things that might be influencing that consumer's choice um, are playing through in terms of their decision at the shop front. So if you can inform and educate the consumer, that I, I think there are still positive attributes about conventional products that can meet that consumer desire. I think a lot of it comes down to actually sort of informing them. Having said that though, um, our, our expectations for the uh, alternative meat market is that it will continue to grow. Um, we will continue to see very strong growth in that market, but it is coming off a very small base. And we don't believe that it's necessarily gonna take any major market share off the conventional products at the moment more that it'll actually start to work in conjunction with things. And we'll start to see um, potentially blends uh, of products, but you know, you've got a lot of major uh, packers and processors over in the U S that are taking positions and financial positions in, 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 in a lot of these alternative spaces and they're becoming protein suppliers. It will become a suite or it will become one of the, the suite of products that are available to consumers on that shelf. Um, I, I still draw a little bit of comfort and, and I'm sure you saw the similar sort of things over in the US as well. Uh, when COVID-19 hit and we had our panic buying at the beginning of last year in the supermarket shelves, pretty much the whole meat cabinet disappeared and the alternative meats was still had products in it. 
um, it, it didn't clear itself out. So I, I, I look at those and I still think, well, consumers are still really focused on, on that conventional product. But I think it is important that we keep an eye on it because there are reasons why consumers are interested in it. And we've got to make sure that we continue to meet and make those um, the information available so that consumers can make informed choices about what they want to consume. Because I, I think we continue to, to, to hold a strong um, proposition for the consumers. Angus, we want to thank you very much for your time and your expertise on behalf of ASI and all the stakeholders here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Not a problem. All the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.